Good afternoon, everyone. We're going to get started. It's so great to see such a full house this afternoon. So welcome to the George Eastman Museum. My name is Emma Rathi. I'm the manager of programs and exhibition production here. You are in luck because this is our final In Focus lecture of 2024 um, with Sherry Smith, our wonderful chief projectionist at the Dryden Theater. So let's give a round of applause to Sherry. If you haven't been to an In Focus lecture before, this is a series that talks about things that happen in the museum, often behind closed doors or up in a projection booth that the public doesn't often get to see. This also can give a closer look at exhibitions and programming here. And so today, Sherry is going to talk about pro film projection. How does a projection work? What does her job look like? What is she doing in the booth? So, and there will be time at the end for Q&A. So any questions that you're thinking throughout, save those till the end, and Sherry will answer all those questions. But I don't want to take any more time, so please welcome Sherry. Thank you. Thank you, thank you so much. It's so nice to see a full room, and especially to welcome my parents and my boyfriend uh, today, and the 2024 class of the L. Jeffrey Selznick School of Film Preservation. Um, and thank you all so much for coming. I'm always excited to have any kind of captive audience when it comes to talking about projection. I'm a bit of a geek in that area. Uh, my background, I'm from Rochester. I graduated from RIT in, um, with a fine arts degree in, in uh, photography. And over the course of 30 some years, I ended up in film and video production. And uh, after that course uh, ran, I didn't know what I was gonna do, and I came across this amazing opportunity that I could study film preservation at the George Eastman Museum. So in my 50s, I applied and got in, and it was the most amazing year of my life. I had a class of 10 people, and half of them were from other countries around the world. Um, it was just phenomenal, and I really just really took a liking to projection and decided that was gonna be my focus. And lo and behold, they ended up hiring me to do film projection. So I pinch myself every day I get to come to work here. It's just, it's an awesome place. And it's not often I get to speak uh, face to face because I'm usually hiding in the projection booth, which is my happy place. Uh, so thank you again for coming. Uh, I titled this, this program Upside Down and Backwards because that is how film travels through the projector. Um, motion picture film travels through the projector with the image upside down and reversed left to right, in other words, upside down and backwards. The projector's light source passes through the film into the lens, which inverts the image so that it appears on the screen in its correct orientation. No projectionist learns projection by themselves, and I've been very, very fortunate to work and learn from the best here at the museum. It's a craft that really is passed on from projectionist to projectionist, and it's a nonstop learning uh, process. Uh, learning typically means something has gone wrong <laughs> in the booth, and to figure it out, um, you learn a new, a new trick. So again, it's always learning, and I don't think you ever get to a point where you know everything, and if you think you do, then you're probably in a lot of trouble. So the art of film projection is really a blend of the technical, mechanical, and art all in one. Film projection is the greatest invention of a magic trick and optical illusion. Thank you. The scientific process of making film, the creative process of storytelling, the projector gear, gears, the shutter, the intermittent movement, what I love about projection is the key role that it plays in film preservation and exhibition. Film projection, film exhibition, culminates all the efforts of preservation and restoration. Access and sharing that work is what it's all about. Projecting a film to share with an audience is the victory lap for every film, and it's very rewarding for me and done with great pride that I'm able to do this for our community and for the museum. Several years ago, the museum published this book, The Art of Film Projection. Uh, although it says it's a beginner's guide, I do use this as a reference book quite often and the people I work with 
chief projectionist back in the day, Spencer Cristiano, who taught me everything I know about projection, um, helped to write this book. And he is now at the Academy of Motion Pictures Museum out in LA. Uh, this book is phenomenal. And um, if you have any interest in projection whatsoever, I highly recommend uh, picking it up in the gift shop. Um, it is a great um, introduction to projection and as well a reference for anyone you know who may do projection. Film projection in my mind is the greatest magic trick ever. I'd like to start with a little bit of projection history and you will see how the film projection that we know today is very much built from the evolution of many ideas simply based on light and shadows. Storytelling with lights and shadows, expressing an idea, that is what projection is in the first place. Early projection arts relied on natural light and fire, and we don't know for certain at what point early humans learned how to make the shadow of their hand resemble a dog or a bunny, but we do know that scientists in the early days of recorded history already had a sophisticated understanding of the physics of light. In the first millennium BCE, the development of shadow play theater performance took off in Asia. Performers told stories by casting their shadows on a backlit cloth stage, puppets made of cloth and leather emerged to cast an ethereal presence onto the stage. Some shadow puppets depict people while others are crafted in the shape of real animals like lions and mythical animals like Chinese dragons. Placed against translucent cloth screens, puppets are then manipulated by skilled masters to create the illusion of movement, which is usually accompanied by song and dance. Through their performances, shadow plays work to pass on historical stories, social morals, and cultural myths from generation to generation. The Han Chinese philosopher Mozi and the Greek philosopher Euclid both describe the phenomenon of light passing through a small aperture and projecting an upside down image on the other side, which would eventually become known as the camera obscura. Camera obscura from the Latin word for dark room, the concept was employed throughout the world in a variety of novel ways. But until the advancement in optical mirrors and lenses of the 17th century, its potential as a projection tool was limited. The flipped image is produced, however demonstrated that light travels in a straight line. The magic lantern from the 1600s was widely credited to Dutch scientist Christian Huygens in 1659 and it was built on the principle of the camera obscura and a century and a half's worth of experiments with new optical technology. Leonardo da Vinci drew a similar projection device in 1515 and other inquisitive minds began combining lenses and mirrors to create all manner of microscopes, telescopes, and optical illusions, although none of them were widely available to the public. When the magic lantern debuted, candles and oil lamps were still the only artificial light source available. But the improvement of concave mirrors and condenser lenses allowed for those light sources to be concentrated into a beam intense enough to project images at previously unseen distances. Here's a short video from the museum of the Ford Museum, the Ford Museum about the magic lantern. Hello, I'm Kristen Gallernow. I'm the Curator of Communications and Information Technology at the Henry Ford, and I want to share this device with you. It's called a Magic Lantern, and it allowed people to experience movie-like entertainment hundreds of years before the cinema or even photography existed. In the 1650s, a Dutch astronomer, mathematician, and physicist named Christian Huygens projected images using an optical lens and candlelight. The effect must have seemed like magic. 
Although Huggins didn't come up with the term magic lantern, he's usually credited with its invention. By the 18th century, magic lanterns were hugely popular in the entertainment world, and lanternists used slides like these to narrate their stories. At first, the images were static, like a single frame of film. There are hand-painted images from classic stories, exotic landscapes, and supernatural creatures that appeared in magic shows called phantasmagorias. Projectionists began to use special effects that we take for granted in movies today, like dissolving views. The slides also became animated. These mechanical slides have multiple layers of rotating glass discs and lever mechanisms that created motion in a single slide. This creature appears to be tormenting a human, and these ocean waves move. This special slide, called a chromatrope, creates beautiful abstract patterns like a kaleidoscope. While the magic lantern may seem very low-tech to us today, it actually contains many layers of creative and material innovation. New illumination sources like limelight, and eventually electricity, meant that projections became brighter and larger. Audiences grew too, filling large theaters where lanternists used stage technology to make their shows even more dramatic, even projecting onto smoke. Despite their popularity, the Magic Lantern eventually ended up shrinking down in audience size, but this time into the home. Magic Lantern sets like this could be purchased from catalogs, and sometimes they were even given to children as Christmas gifts. But eventually the lantern could no longer compete with the wonders of the cinema. The author Charles Dickens experienced the magic lantern, and he was very excited by the way it seemed to mimic the human imagination, those sorts of mental images that we get, and the fuzzy edges of human memory. One of the most popular slide sets ever created for the magic lantern was of Dickens' A Christmas Carol. We're excited to present a magic lantern interpretation. The fanatic kistoscope. <laughs> So now we're in the 1800s, we're starting to create motion from still images. And this introduces the idea of persistence of vision, black space, and single images used in order to create fluid motion. Here is another short video to talk about that early history. Inspired by Faraday's wheel, Josef Plateau in Brussels and Simon Stampfer in Vienna invent the phenakistoscope independently of one another in 1832. Stampfer called it the stroboscope. In England, it was known as the phantoscope. This disc demonstrates continuous movement for the first time. Comparable to film because it uses minimal differences between the images to create the illusion of movement. In 1833, Horner invented the dedaleum, later called the zoetrope, or wheel of life. Here, the phases of movement are also seen in the form of an infinite loop through the slits. We see an image, then no image, and then a slightly different second image producing the illusion of movement in the mind of the viewer. In 1877, Emile Renault built his praxinoscope. We see the images in the mirrors.
the function of the dark phase between the slits is taken over by the angle at which the mirrors are set up. start to look at even more closer to what projection is as we know it today. Uh, again, here's a short video and you may recognize the host. Now here on my movie Ola, I have a film that reenacts the story of Emil Renault and his remarkable theater optique. Renault was a painter of lantern slides who lived in a small apartment in Paris in the year 1877. He was intrigued with the early animation devices. He studied and read all he could about them in the scientific periodicals of his day. Finally, he invented a machine of his own called the Praxinoscope, which borrowed the interchangeable action strips from the zoetrope. But he replaced the slits on the zoetrope with mirrors set edge to edge around a revolving center. Each individual picture on the outer rim is reflected on one of the mirrors. And here, with a charm that still enchants and delights us today, the images glide and flow along with a mysterious life of their own. Still, Renault wasn't satisfied. Soon he hit upon the idea of drawing his pictures on strips of black paper. This enabled him to combine a background on a separate card with the action drawings. The complete effect was viewed through a tiny proscenium. He called his improved machine the Theater Praxinoscope. Here one could see a vaudeville show in miniature. Just a simple change of scenery, a new cast of characters, and a brand new act is ready to start. It doesn't matter that the entire performance lasts only a few seconds, or that the strip is made up of only 12 poses. It still keeps you spellbound. You want to see it again and again. But to Reno's mind, this still left much to be desired. He wanted something better, and bigger. At last he had it. The short picture strips had been expanded to a long band containing 500 hand-painted slides drawn on transparent gelatin. Small holes punched between each image foreshadowed the perforations on modern film. Each hole meshes into the teeth of the large wheel rotating at the same speed as the 36 mirrors at the center. Each individual image is lighted up separately. By an interplay of mirrors and lenses, the ray of light is reflected back to a mobile mirror, which in turn projects the enlarged image onto a screen. By adapting the principle of the magic lantern to his machine, he was able to project a background onto the same screen. Here, his actors were life-size. Here, he could almost create the illusion of reality. From a toy in the home, his idea had grown into a form of public entertainment. Renault called it the theater optique. 
Here the people of Paris could view a complete quarter of an hour performance. In the course of his career as a showman, he produced seven different shows, all accompanied by appropriate mood music. For more than 10 years, Reno worked here behind the screen that separated the audience from his primitive projection booth. And in this period, he played to over a half million delighted patrons. magnetism, engineering, and countless others in the 1800s gives birth to an explosion of scientific and technological advancements that would lead to the advent of projected cinema before the century's end. George Eastman is making a flexible film at this point with emulsion, replacing photography on glass plates, and the Edison Company has developed its own system of projection and filmmaking known as the projectoscope or projecting kinetoscope in November of 1896. This is a picture of George Eastman on the left. I'm sorry. Yeah, George Eastman's on the left. And on the right is Thomas Edison behind the camera on one of his visits to Rochester. And here we are, the motion picture operator, also known as the projectionist. In the beginning, the projector operator was the show. The machine or projector was the focus of everyone's intent attention. It was an amazing machine. And in the beginning, the projectionist was in the room with the audience. And films didn't really have a story. They were mostly shots of just everyday life. And the interaction was really the projector itself and the image and music. Eventually, as the films began to have more of a storyline, people complained that the projector was too loud and noisy, so the projectionist got kicked up to a booth. Not a bad idea since, for the safety of the audience, all these early films were projected on. Nitrate film, a film base that was made of nitrate. Highly, highly flammable. Um, nitrate film is classified as a dangerous goods, and it requires a license for storage and transportation. We have quite a large collection of nitrate film here at the George Eastman Museum, which is housed outside of the city limits in Chai Lai. Apparently they don't mind. <laughs> um, nitrate, nitrate film stock was used in every major film production before 1951, and many silent films only survived because they were printed to 16 millimeter film, which did not use a nitrate base. Nitrate film burns at a higher temperature than even gasoline. Chemically, nitrate film is very similar to gunpowder. Once ignited, a nitrate fire cannot be extinguished because the combustion process generates its own oxygen. Nitrate fire also generates nitric acid fumes. You cannot put it out. It burns underwater. And here's a little video demo. And this guy's going to try and put it out with a fire extinguisher. This is just a very small amount of film. That's still going. going. Yeah. Yeah. Wow. Look at the smoke. Whoa. <laughs> That's good. Sweet. Can I get a hold of it? The next video is our own Jeff Stoiber out at our uh, nitrate vaults when I was in the cells next door and we did our section out there. Deb lit a very small piece of nitrate. Oh, that's pretty cool. 
Imagine back in the early days what the projectionists had to contend with. So now that you know all about nitrate film, I would like to cordially invite you to the Nitrate Picture Show. <laughs> we host this every year. People come from all over the world. We have films that come from all over the world on nitrate film. The projectors that we use for nitrate projection are original to the Dryden Theater from 1951 when the theater first opened. And currently, we are the only theater on the East Coast that can still project nitrate film publicly. The clear nitrate base uh, creates a very luminous, luminous image, especially with Technicolor and black and white film. So here is our old-timey projection guy. Not only did he have nitrate film to work with, he was also using a light source of flame from carbon rods just behind the film to create the light source. The capable projectionist is not a mechanical worker whose duties are limited to loading the projector and later placing the film back into the can. He is constantly improving his knowledge, interested in principles of electricity, heat, optics, lenses, light and shadow effects, photography and light mediums. He is familiar with the almost countless parts of the very delicate mechanism and he is using inflammable material, which, when carelessly handled, can do untold damage and cause needless expense. That is an article from Building Theater Patronage from 1927. So very thrilling to be a projectionist back in the day. They were, before they took on the name projectionist, they were called the picture machine operator. And the Fire hazards were very well known throughout the industry. Operators worked in very cramped quarters, at first in tiny, unventilated cabinets. It was especially at the beginning not just a complicated, but a dangerous job. The furnace-like heat generated by the machinery in the small booth, carbon dust from the arc lamps, and then unknown dangers of the asbestos that lined the booths were all extreme hazards. Many of the projectionists got hands or their face burned, or worse, as a result of the highly combustible and flammable nitrocellulose film. In the 1930s, international projectionists became a periodical that uh, started in the 1930s, and it sought to unify the profession and set standards and expectations, especially for movie house owners because they were cheap and they weren't really had the, they didn't have the projectionist um, health in mind. Um, so the conditions were small and cramped, and they were called machine cabinets or operators box. They were almost unbearable, and the operators had to contend with wild, widely circulating film stock that had great wear and tear. So they were in charge of ensuring that the individual frames of film could travel safely past the sprockets on the machine. In the earlier days, they made hasty splices with whatever they had at hand, straight pins, safety pins, wire, or even gum. Eventually, projectionists uni unionized in the same union as Stage Theater, uh, the International Alliance of Theatrical Stage Employees and Moving Picture Machine Operators of the United States and Canada. If you ever sit through the, all the credits of a movie at the movie theater, you will see this logo at the very end. Rochester is not a unionized uh, projection outfit, but in New York City, they still work uh, in a union. This is our beautiful Sentry projector. This, uh, like I mentioned, we have two of these because in our projection booth, we do reel-to-reel -reel changeovers. So this is one of our Sentry projectors. And uh, it was brought into the theater in 1951 when we first opened. Uh, at that time, the, the light source were carbon arcs, and that changed over to 2,000 watt xenon bulbs in the late 70s. So how does a film go from the vault to the projection booth? 
Not all of our films we play in the Dryden Theater come from our vaults. If they come from our vaults, they come from here. Mm -hmm. And before it can leave the vault and come upstairs, it's placed in a holding room where the temperature is just a bit warmer and the film cans have to stay in there for 24 hours before taken upstairs. The holding room allows the film to warm up a little bit before, uh, but not too fast, preventing any condensation. This is what it looks like um, when we store our films in our vaults. They're wrapped um, tails out, which means the end of the film is at the beginning, and emulsion in, and they're stored at um, a very cold temperature and humidity controlled rooms. So this is not a projectable format that we get the, the, the film comes upstairs and we have to um, inspect it, and I'll, but I'll get to that. We also get films from out of house and these relics that look like uh, something from repurposed from World War I. Um, they're called Goldbergs and a lot of our prints that come from out of house like the Library of Congress or Museum of Modern Art and other distributors arrive like this. Or they come in a box with broken plastic projection reels. Um, <laughs> also not a safe projectable format. We do get films from all over the world, um, even Japan, which has been a, um, a most recent um, series that we've done in the Dryden. So nothing that comes in goes right to the booth. Before it goes to the booth, it has to go through a projection inspection. And the, project, the inspection is really the roadmap and the key to the projectionist having a successful show. It, and our mindset while we're doing the inspection is, is this film going to make it through the projector? How can I best communicate to the projectionist? And how can I make sure that this film is safe and that our projectors aren't damaged? This is our inspection form that we fill out. We, we log the title, how many reels, what the frame rate is. For our silent films, there's variable frame rates. Um, just the very pertinent information that the projectionist needs to know um, before projecting the film. Here's our tool cabinet. Thank you, Craftsman. And our workbench. So here we have a plastic reel that's come from out of house on the left, and I'm gonna inspect it and wind it onto that metal reel on the right. Um, the goal for inspection is to provide the projectionist with all the information they need to have a good show. 90% of the projectionist's work is based on this inspection report. So what are we looking for when we inspect a film? The first thing you want to look for is, is the film wound at the beginning or the end of the film? The film which is stored in our vaults would come upstairs with the end of the tails out. The plastic reels we get from outside distributors are of questionable quality and at best they're also wound onto our metal projection reels. So everything has to go from either from our vault, from the cores, or from an outside print and needs to be wound on a metal projection reel. So is it at the beginning or is it at the end? So now I've got my film ready to wind and I've got my tools ready. So um, let's assume for demonstration purposes, this film is tails out. It is at the end of the film. So I'm winding it from the end of the film onto the metal reel so it'll be at the start of the film. Next, I need to check to see which side is the base side of the film and which side is the emulsion side. Remember that on the projector, the film must be wound emulsion out with the base in. So how do we figure that out? Well, one way to tell is that on the emulsion side, the text can be read correctly. If it's the base side, the text is backwards. So base is backwards, that's kind of easy to remember. Sometimes you can tell just by looking at the film, the emulsion side has more of a matte surface and the base side tends to be very shiny. 
Okay, so now we know that I'm winding the film correctly onto the projection reel. Since we're at the tail of the film, our next step is to look at the cue marks, which come in a variety of shapes. We have two pairs, two, two pairs of projector, projectors in the booth, the sentries and the kinetons. We project reel-to-reel -reel changeovers. So if I'm using the two sentry projectors, I'm switching back and forth between two projectors, reel one, then to reel two, and so on and so on. And in order to do that, we have two sets of cue marks. One set of the cue marks are called motor start cues, and the others are called changeover cues. As the film is playing, the first set of cues, the motor start cues, tell the projectionist to start the motor on the next projector. The second set of cues tell the projectionist to cut to the next reel and change over to the next projector. Each set of cue marks are on four frames of film, located in the upper right side of the picture of the frame. 24 frames a second are passing through the projector, so the cue marks appear for one sixth of a second. You cannot blink <laughs> when you are looking for the cue marks. It's especially exciting if you've got a film with a lot of explosions and fireworks and you're trying to find a cue mark. Here's a sample of what some of those look like. Um, the ones on the left are called black labs or black dots. If our films show up without any cue marks at all, we add our own, and those are used with grease pencil, and we just put a slash where the cue mark would be. On the right-hand side are called scribe cues. These um, specific measurements are where the cue marks go, are standard set by the Society of Motion Picture and Television Engineers, also referred to as SIMPTI. The motor start cues should be one foot 12 frame, sorry, 10 feet, 12 frames from the first changeover cue. The fourth changeover cue should be 18 frames from the last image. So we measure the placement of our cue marks and record them on the inspection report. Sometimes the cue marks are where they're supposed to be and sometimes they're not. Based on the cue mark measurements, the projectionist will know where to cue up the countdown on the next reel. If the cue marks are wrong or closer together than they're supposed to be, the next reel's countdown must be adjusted. The measurement of the countdown and the cue marks are intertwined by a little bit of math. Next, we need to determine the soundtrack, of which there are many. This is a picture showing all the different real estate of sound on a, on a piece of film. Uh, it's pretty amazing how much they can fit on there. So A, the outside track, is Sony Dynamic Digital Sound, also known as SDDS, found on the outer edge of the film. This supports up to eight independent channels of sound. Uh, the BSRD soundtrack is another Dolby soundtrack with a track of six discrete channels of digital sound. C is called a DTS track. It's the furthest, most inward, closest to the frame. It looks like Morse code. That is something that we actually just used last night. The film will come with a disc, and we load that disc into a computer the computer records the file, and then the film is wound through a special DTS soundtrack, and the two talk to each other, and the song miraculously plays in the theater. It's pretty cool. So, sorry, I'm trying to figure out where I left off. DTS was introduced in 1993 as a competitor to Dolby, and finally, the other track that we have left, letter D, is the analog track, but it's in stereo. I can tell that it's stereo because the two wavy lines don't match. And in case you're wondering, we do not use all these soundtracks at once. We pick one, and we test which one sounds best in the theater. Quite often, we don't get the disc that comes with a DTS soundtrack, and only one of our projector pairs can read the cyan blue soundtrack. We program the sound panels in the booth 
to use the correct sound format. This is an example of a variable density soundtrack. This is uh, used a lot when sound first came on to film. So that's at the top left. Um, it's varying levels of gray. So the darker the line, the louder the film. The one underneath that is a variable area soundtrack. And that is a mono soundtrack. I can tell because the lines match. And then the one on the right is also a analog soundtrack um, in stereo. And you can see that each line is different and it does not match. This is a variable density track. Again, like I said, the shades of gray vary as the sound changes, the darker, the louder. And this is very typical of the older films. Before newer sound technologies, most soundtracks were almost entirely analog, mono, optical tracks. The fatter the line, the louder the sound. So next, what is the material of the film we are looking at? Is it nitrate? Is it acetate safety film? Or is it polyester? So now we're looking for information on the edges of the film, or edge codes. Kodak had a very secret way of, of distinguishing what year their film stock was from. They used triangles, circles, and plus signs. And these codes related to a specific year. So you can see on the left, we have the triangle plus square. And Tom and Jerry is a triangle plus. This is a list of the, the codes repeated every 20 years, but this is, and then after 2001, they just started putting the year on the, on the film stock. <laughs> Bless their soul. Um, my birth year is triangle, triangle. <laughs> um, other, other identifiers include the word safety film, so that would be acetate. And also we're looking for who made the film. Is it Kodak, Agfa? Sometimes it doesn't say anything. Uh, so we know that this is Kodak stock. If it's polyester, one clue is that we can look right through it. If you hold it up to a light, it's very transparent. Okay, so now we know our film material. We know what year it's from. We know the soundtracks and we've measured our cue marks. Next on the list is what is the aspect ratio? What is the frame size? Aspect ratio, in other words, is how the image is printed on the film. What is the size of the image? The ratio is between the height, always stated as one, and the image and the width, of the image and the width. The world standard for 35 millimeter film with four perforations per frame with an aspect ratio of 1.33 was adapted in 1907 with no soundtrack. So this is a full frame image uh, prior, that would be a silent film. Once they added sound, here we have a variable density soundtrack. Uh, the aspect ratio changed to 1.37. So it got a little smaller. So once we know the aspect ratio, that's gonna tell us what lens to use in the projector and what aperture plate to use in front of the light. Or in front, yeah. So the aspect ratio is how we mask the light and the frame with the image with the aperture plate. If we didn't put in an aperture plate in the projector, you would see the soundtrack and all the perforations. So the aperture plate is really a way that we can shape the light and mask around that frame of the film. We'll give you an idea of the dimensions. So in the 1950s, theaters really fought the competition of television. So they started making films bigger and bigger and wider and wider. And CinemaScope was one of those. Now we can wind through the film to check for damage or any other oddity that would affect projection. The key concern is will this film safely travel through the projector? Will it damage our projector? and any other weird thing that the projectionist may need to know. We're also looking for splices. Are they strong? Or are they falling apart? Has the film been spliced back together with four perforations on each frame? We also have to check the pitch of the splice. Sometimes if we lay it down on our splicer, it'll pitch up like this. That means that the splice is 
probably not going to go through the film gate very successfully, so we'd have to crack that. There's some more splices. They come in taped form, cement, or ultrasonic. Sometimes we find an intermission. Um, that's always a little surprise for longer films. Sometimes we get film that looks like this. Um, this is some pretty nasty damage. There's stressed perfs. There's missing perforations. The image is torn up. <coughs> this is a, probably a worst case scenario. So now we've reached the beginning of the film, and if it's real one, we need to tell the projectionist how it starts. Here's a fellow that looks very familiar, the MGM lion. Now we're at the beginning of every film, at the beginning of the film, and it should have a countdown. One kind of countdown counts seconds, and the other standard countdown counts feet. So the one on the left is called an academy countdown, and that counts feet. So we want to cue up the projector on the nine because it's supposed to be nine feet from the first image. The other case, the other countdown counts seconds. So it's, it, we frame it on the six, but that's still six seconds is nine feet from the first image of the film. That's called a SMPTE countdown. This is our counter that we use to measure feet and frames. And finally, our Report is inspection is done and our film has made it to the booth. This is where the magic happens. Here is our beautiful century projector again. As I mentioned, we project films as changeovers. In other words, we go from one projector to the next. So remember our early days of projection using light and shadow, black space and persistence of vision, the camera obscura from 1604, Light from a scene passes through a pinhole and an image hits the surface with the image upside down and backwards. The zoetrope, where strips of images viewed through a spinning drum with black space and slits create that fluid motion. The camera, obscura, and zoetrope really built on the concepts that are still at play in our modern projector. The film is traveling through the projector upside down and backwards. The lens flips the image into its proper orientation but wait, there's more. What you're seeing on the screen is mostly nothing at all. While the film is moving continuously through the projector, it is not moving continu continuously past the light. The film is moving through a gate intermittently, and the gate is where each film frame comes in front of the light. It is stopping and starting in the gate in tandem with the precise movement of a two-blade shutter that blocks the light and an intermittent sprocket wheel. Your persistence of vision holds the image in your mind while the shutter is blocking the light. The single frame of image is actually blocked from the light twice, once to move the next image in place and the second to keep the image smooth. And here is a little short video that will explain it. Camera speed. Now, here is a motion picture film. A thousand feet. Sixteen thousand separate photographs. Let's tidy up this tangle of film by putting it on a reel. Now, we'll build a projection machine to show the pictures on a screen. The film unwinds from the reel and rewinds onto another reel after it runs through the projector. To throw the picture on the screen, there is a bright light with a reflector behind it to send the light rays in the right direction and a lens to concentrate the light. The film passes a hole or aperture which lets the light go through only one picture at a time. There is another lens to focus the pictures on the screen. By adjusting the lenses, the picture can be made sharp and clear. Let's start the machine moving. The still pictures blur because they're moving all the time. And this won't do at all. We need something to hold each picture still long enough for us to look at it in between the changes. When the film is started and stopped in rapid succession, the eye sees the changes being made and the result is streaks 
instead of movies. So we need a shutter to cut off the light while every change of picture is being made and let light through only while the film is standing still. Surprising as it seems, you never see a motion picture while it is actually moving. The only time a movie moves is when the shutter keeps you from seeing the change of picture. Then we see it just the way it looks in real life. Now we have the important parts of a projector for showing motion pictures on the screen. But let's change that drawing to an actual machine at work. This reel holds the supply of motion picture film which passes through the projector at a speed of 90 feet each minute. Slots on this aperture plate guide the film past the narrow beam of light so that only one picture can be seen at a time. The adjustable lens which gives us a clear, sharp picture on the screen, is placed in the path of the light rays after they pass through the film. Sprockets, which guide the film as well as start it and stop it, are placed in position to hold the film in proper position at all times. The shutter is placed behind the film to cut off the light at intervals while the pictures change. see the light being blocked by the shutter. I'm going to take this out of presentation so I can show you very slowly a lot of what you're seeing is nothing. But it wouldn't work if we didn't have that black space. It would just look like blurring, you're actually not seeing the movie, the film move. You're seeing a rapid succession of still frames. This is a slow-mo I did of the sentry projector in the booth. take it out of presentation mode and slow it down. said that the film is not moving continuously through the projector past the light source. It is stopping and starting, but the rest of the film is, is moving continuously. So in order to keep the film safe, we create these loops at the top and the bottom. The bottom one's kind of hard to see because we have to give it slack so it can stop and start without ripping the film. And the intermittent gear is at the bottom, and so that is the gear that is stopping and stopping the film or holding it in place and then moving it ahead. And that happens, you know, 24 frames a second. So unless I do a slow-mo, it really, you don't see that. Okay. This is Roger Rabbit. You get the idea. So you can start to see how the connection and the evolution of motion moving image really came about through a series of experiments and trial and errors. Lastly, 
Now that you're all so excited about projection like I am, I'd like to show you a trailer to a film that we're going to be showing in the Dryden on Friday, December 15th. Have you ever looked back on your life to a year where it felt like everything important to you first began? The 80s were a wonderful time to catch up on old Hollywood. The prints were available, the old cinemas were still available. You would pat the projector at the end of the night, say, oh, good job, and that way you kept them happy, and the next day they'd come and perform well for you again, if you're lucky. Then overnight, digital projection changed the way we see movies forever. We sort of knew it was coming, but we didn't really have a sense of what it could mean. And now, it's threatening to change the way we'll remember them. Film running through a projector is transferred to an audience. I think there is a life to that image. There are hundreds, if not thousands, of reels of unidentified films sitting in archives throughout the world. People have their little fiefdoms and whatever and whatnot. Well, you know, shouldn't the importance be to save the films? The preciousness of this print, I, I cannot tell you how it makes you feel. The argument that, well, my kids won't watch black and white, one of two things has to happen. Your kids have to grow up. Hey, I saw a photocopy of the Mona Lisa. I know what the Mona Lisa looks yeah, like. It's like, yeah, yeah. technically you do know what the Mona Lisa looks like, but you haven't seen it. Film has a substance which is entirely lacking in what I basically think is big screen television. That's baloney. Are we the last generation to be able to see movies this way? Yes. The art form of projected film is on its way out, not because it's not good. Wow, you forget how good it is. The only people who are seeing this risk in any degree are the people who are actually displaced, the projectionists. some of the things that we talked about um, that you're welcome to look at. There's uh, Dryden film schedules for films we have coming up. There's information on the Night Treat Picture Show and also the film projection book that I mentioned. Um, so I'm happy to take any questions. I really appreciate you being here. Um, thank you for putting up with <laughs> the world of projection. Um, have any questions? Sir. I assume that the soundtrack that's on the that's on the film is the sound that is on the track is not the sound for the frame that's right there. It's Correct. The frame is stuttering through, right? It's Correct. Separated. So, Correct. So the sound head, the sound drum comes after the light. So the soundtrack is moved accordingly to that space, um, and that part of the projector is moving continuously and a light is reading the, the soundtrack on a sound drum, okay. and it comes after. If it's 16 millimeter, it comes before, because 16 has got its own set of rules, but yes, good question. Yes? So, a follow-up on that. If everyone's familiar to see some old movie or something and the sound's not uh, matching, it's off and they have a millisecond or something, um, What's the mistake? Who is that the projectionist? That oh no. <laughs> <laughs> so I'm, I'm wondering is, why is that happening? Probably, and my best guess would be that the film was printed poorly. Okay. Um, if it's a copy, that yeah. it wasn't synced up properly. Okay. Yeah. Yeah, that does happen sometimes. We've shown 16 millimeter films, especially in the in the booth, and I'm like, oh, the lip sync is a little off. But thank you. You're welcome. Thank you. Alyssa. Hi, Sherry. Uh, what has been one of your favorite films to project, or one that you were really excited to get your hands on? And oh, come into play I have a story. <laughs> so I worked at the little theater as well, and when the last, what was it called? Oh. Tarantino film. Uh, yeah, what was it called though? Once Upon a Time in Hollywood. 
Um, we got one of the only 35 millimeter prints of 50 theaters in the, in, in the country. So the projectors that we had, the theater one was closed down, so we had to reassemble the projectors in the back theater of the Little and Theater 5. Daryl Jones, who works here, who is all things projection, he's been doing projection for 60 years or something. He is our guru of projection. We all want to download Daryl's brain. <laughs> Daryl was able to retrofit the, the projectors in the back theater that had been flipped into platter systems back into reel to reel changeovers. But in order to do that, the projector sat too low to the ground, so there wasn't room for a take up reel on the bottom. So he maneuvered a path for the film to travel on one projector to the right and one projector to the left on a, to the, a motor and a take-up reel. So the film was going through the projector, down a path, over to the right, and around, a, it, it was just crazy, um, but it worked. And so I got to project opening night of Once Upon a Time in Hollywood, and I screened it so many times with my other projectionist friends that it became very much stuck in our heads and we started recording the, our favorite lines and it just became like, but that was, that was really exciting to, to be able to, with the print came in on the day that we were first screening it, it was wound tails out, some of them, some were wound correctly, no cue marks. Um, so we really had to rush to get it, get it going and that was just so much fun, um, I would say. That would be my, but any film, I love projecting at any film um, I enjoy. Yes? I just want to say thank you because um, as a little girl, I played with a 16 millimeter projector in, in my father's home, in my home, in the mm -hmm. or in school, in middle school, they would have little movies to show in classes. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. And it was this big, grueling man in there. Yeah. And all he was yeah. a monster. And yeah. So uh, I just really, I mean, and I know this is no comparison, but it's really fantastic for me to see. Oh, well, thank you. Involved in anything like that. Yeah. To see this presentation and to know and has increased my appreciation. Oh, good. For all of you up in this box. Yeah. <laughs> Every time, I mean, I really, it's so, it's such an amazing way the gears all work. The yeah. It's got the precision of a sewing machine and a watch, and they're all working together. And at the same time, this film is going through the projector upside down, and a light is able to throw it all the way across the room. It's just, every time I go in the booth to start the projector, I'm like, oh my God, is this going to work? And I remember when we showed the film, and the thing is right. Yeah. And then I have to sit there, and I have to move, and everything else. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> I know. It, um, but what an appreciation and what a knowledge base and skill that you all have. Thank you so much. Oh, thank you for being here. Thank you. <laughs> Did you have a question? I just also wanted to thank you very Aww. much. I, I, I teach a film class in Buffalo. Oh, cool. Um, to juniors and seniors is a two year class. And every year I, you know, I went to our school district's uh, you know, this graveyard. Mm -hmm. The equipment. Yeah. Um, so I also was a middle school <laughs> and elementary school AV geek, right? Um, and there were film strip projectors, and um, and six, I took the uh, two or three 16 millimeter projectors, and I real, I, you know, I roll that out every year to show um, mm. kids, and um, it is so crazy how many kids have never, mm -hmm. no idea about like what this even exists. That yeah. Film and their, their minds are blown when I show them the cans of these, like, you know, really ancient, yeah. you know, um, the life of Charles Dickens, I think, is one of the ones I show. Uh, I pull out and, um, you know, I let them smell the film yeah. and, and uh, you know, the de deteriorating film. And um, they, their minds are completely blown. And I don't think they really, like, believe, like, the whole, um, the way that our mind watches um, mm -hmm. films. I don't, I don't think they get it. Oh, yeah. I don't know if I totally got it either. Yeah, I'm <laughs> still 
trying to figure it out. Um, yeah. And I, yeah. Um, so well, you should bring them here. We'll do it. Well, I, I used to, but it, uh, it made it very difficult for us to do field trips. So, uh, but I'm going to be, I'm going to work on it again. I'm going to see if we can come this year. So. All right. Well, maybe I can come to your school. Oh, yeah. <laughs> that would be great. Oh, my God. Yeah, so thank you. This yeah, oh, really my pleasure, my pleasure. Yes. Okay, I'm trying to, I lived through this yes. as they have, and I'm trying to figure out where's the transition point where, like, I'm remembering I'm watching movies, and they're like this, mm -hmm. and then I'm watching digital. And where is the transitional point there where it switched off to digital? I don't know the year. I just remember that um, you know with digital cameras, it's a lot more cost effective for movie theaters to run digital. You don't have the shipping costs. If you lift that Goldberg over there and how much it weighs, our shipping costs are crazy. They're like four hundred dollars for a film. Um, so a digital a digital print will come in a little box. Um, and I just remember the the discussion about the booths having to be turned over to digital equipment and how expensive that was. But once you have a digital setup, then your costs are much lower. Um, sadly, I don't think everyone saved their, their projector, their film projectors. Um, so I, I don't know if I'm answering your question, but um, I don't know the year. Um, was it the 19th? No, I would say 90s, early 2000s. Yeah, early 2000s. Yeah. 2009. Oh, okay, thank you. <laughs> That's when it goes mainstream. Like okay. Yeah. Yeah. Avatar. Yeah. Oh, right, right, right. Yeah, the movie <laughs> Avatar. So, and for cinematographers, too, um, shooting digital. Um, was a lot more affordable. You can go back and rewind and check. Just like, you know, if you have, instead of taking your film to the store to get processed, you can just look on your phone and say, oh, do I like this or not? Um, yeah. Um, I know there are some really key people who are very much advocating still for shooting on film, and it is making a comeback. Um, Christopher Nolan was um, instrumental in keeping the Kodak factory going. They, the director of, the, of Kodak at one point went out to California to meet with the studios and said, hey, we're gonna shut down our factory if you guys aren't gonna be using film anymore. And the studio said, yeah, shut it down. We'll just, we'll use digital. And then somehow they met with Christopher Nolan and Christopher <coughs> Nolan said, don't you dare shut it down. I'm gonna get all my friends and all my other people in the business to shoot on film. And, Christopher Nolan really implemented the and pushed the effort to keep film um, as a way of shooting film and projecting it. Um, like the gentleman said in the video, you know what the Mona Lisa looks like, but you've never seen it. So film as it was shot and meant to be presented is more authentic if it's projected on film. And actually digital has its own set of problems in terms of archiving. Um, film is the longest lasting a way to archive a film. So even if someone does shoot something digitally, they will print it to film and store it. Um, so. Any other questions? Yes. Yeah. <laughs> so, so when did they transition from? Nineteen fifty one. They stopped making okay. it. They always had the ability to make safety film, but nitrate was cheaper oh. and nitrate was stronger. Um, and it has this really luminous um, visual effect, especially with Technicolor and black and white film. It just there, looks beautiful. Is there a difference in your I, I, my understand, well, nitrate film is, the way I understood it was that it was stronger, it didn't break as much as acid okay. safety film yeah. going through the projector. Um, I guess they weren't so concerned about the fires. Uh, well, <laughs> I get that. Ocean doesn't exist. Yeah, right. Um, I feel like the nitrate picture show here at the museum, there's a little bit of that element of, like when you go to a race car, 
uh, rant, like, oh, maybe it'll be a crash, maybe there'll be a little fire. <laughs> Um, but we, when we do project nitrate, it's a whole other set of rules in the booth. We have three projectionists instead of one. Each projectionist is in control of one of the projectors, and we have a third person that's taking away the reel that just played and giving us the next reel. Mm -hmm. So we never leave the projector. Um, the projector that's playing is watching the gate through the window of the projector, looking for any kind of smoke or whatever and the other projectionist um, is queuing up their next reel and watching the screen to see if everything's in focus and communicating that to the other projectionist. So. And then if there is an incident, we turn off the lamp, we stop the projector, hopefully we think to turn the lights on in the theater, and then we pull on a wrench that's hanging in the booth and that drops the firewalls that are made of steel to keep the fire from spreading, and then we run. Mm -hmm. <laughs> yeah. So, yeah, it's a little scary. <laughs> but, yeah, every year. <laughs> it is pretty amazing. I mean, people come from all over the world. It's wild. Yes? Thank you for coming. Yeah, that's all our nitrate film. We have the original negatives to Gone with the Wind, The Wizard of Oz. I mean, it's just, we, you know, and I, I'm from Rochester, and I had come here as a kid and everything, and I loved going to the Dryden. I never realized until I was in the Selznick program that this place is known internationally as one, as one of the leaders in film preservation. Um, many of the people that I have worked with that are great, like Spencer, you know, he's out in LA now. One of our other chief projectionists was just recently hired to work in the Swedish Film Archives. I mean, it really is an, a spot of recognition internationally of the work that we do here. And unfortunately, not many people who live here know. Um, I mean, even for me, when I first found out about it, I was it was like a light came down from the sky and I went, oh my gosh, that's what I want to do. And, here I am. <laughs> yes? When is the uh, festival, that nitrate festival? When is it? Yes. Uh, at the beginning of June, the first week of June. Yep. I think it actually starts like the last day of May. Um, and then it's a Thursday, Friday, Saturday, Sunday. And then we don't announce any of the films. So everyone who buys a pass to this thing has no idea what we're showing. <laughs> And then on the Thursday, we announce, we do a press conference and we announce all the titles of the film except one. The last one that we project on Sunday is called Blind Date with Nitrate. <laughs> and you, no one knows what the movie is except the projections um, until the curtain goes up and the light hits the screen, which is a really cool way to see a movie. Um, one year we did Pinocchio. That was really cool. Pinocchio and Nitrate. <laughs> yes. I just want to, I wonder if you can move this conversation into the concourse just because we have a Oh, sure. Here. I'm sorry. It's okay. Thank you so much for coming. I really appreciate your attention.